morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Christopher Nesbitt. I, I manage a small non-governmental organization in Toledo District called Maya Mountain Research Farm. Uh, we are dedicated to examining the intersection where agriculture overlaps with ecology. Uh, we're, we're particularly focused right now on ways to draw down atmospheric carbon uh, using tree crops. Um, um, uh, Maya Mountain Research Farm is located in San Pedro, Colombia, where on the upper branch, uh, upper parts of the Colombia branch of Rio Grande. To the north of us is the Colombia Forest Reserve, a large unbroken forest uh, that extends all the way up to Cayo District. Um, what we're talking about specifically today is how do we use agriculture to draw down carbon and to repair uh, the hydrological cycle that's often broken by agriculture. Um, we're looking at how to do that using degraded lands. Worldwide, there are eight, uh, 950 million to 1.1 billion acres of degraded agricultural landscapes. Uh, and these are, tend to be lands that have been damaged by uh, previous agricultural practices that cannot be returned back to those agricultural practices without massive, unsustainable amounts of off-farm inputs. So uh, we're talking specifically about things like cattle pasture, uh, former citrus grove here in Belize that we see a lot of it, uh, old degraded citrus grove that's come to the end of its productive lifespan. Uh, banana plantations, uh, overworks milpa where the fallow period is no longer being observed, uh, particularly down in Toledo district where my wife and I live. We're looking at land that where the, the actual cropping regime of, of milpa is a three year cropping regime and then a, a nine year fallow period. Uh, and what we're finding out is as population density expands and communities expands, adjacent land to communities that's easy to access is getting a uh, four or five year cropping regime and then a four or five year fallow period uh, resulting in soil collapse. Uh, things like export based agriculture in the north, they had a papaya project that has now come to its end. Uh, these lands and sugarcane land can all be converted to what we're talking about. So. Subumbra floreo, everybody knows that under the trees will flourish. Um, and here in Belize, we have a long history of relationship with trees, mostly extracting. Uh, but they had industries like the chicle industry that took advantage of existing trees. We have the, the cacao industry that is uh, both historically relevant from the, the Maya period, but also uh, locally and uh, recently very relevant. Uh, one of the major economic pillars of Toledo district and rural communities is cacao. Uh, and what we're talking about is how do we rebuild those forests so that we can flourish in the shade of the forest. So sadly, we're losing a lot of forests. Uh, in 1980, Belize had 74.4% uh, forest cover. 30 years later, we had dropped to 62.8% forest cover. And Last year, we were down to 57.6% forest cover. So we're losing a lot of forest cover really fast. And part of the things that make, part of the re reason that Belize is such a beautiful, lovely place to live uh, is because we have forests. And forests provide ecosystem services like uh, habitat creation, um, uh, water retention so that our, our rivers and streams don't run dry. Uh, and uh, drawing down carbon and giving us clean air and shade, and that's disappearing. So, in 1985, Belize had a population of 150,000 people. In uh, 2000, uh, 2018, it's estimated our population has expanded to 380,000 people. In a similar period, in 1985, Guatemala had a population of 6 million people, and despite a genocide that killed two, two to 300,000 of their own citizens, uh, perpetrated by their government, in 2018, their population had grown to 17.4 million people. Now, the Paten, 
For those of you who might have passed through the Paten in the, in the mid-1980s, the Paten was largely unbroken forest of the Paten, which is 50% uh, larger than Belize, had a similar population of 150,000 people, which meant they had a smaller population density. However, in 2018, it is estimated that they had 2.4 million people. So we had uh, uh, friends from uh, Conservation and Development yesterday, FCD, in the front row, and they actually came to our farm to get some training on agroforestry. And one of the things that they talk about is because the Paten has been deforested and their land has been degraded so rapidly, specifically in the last 20 years since the, the peace accord was signed between the main guerrilla groups and the uh, Guatemalan Armed Forces, the Paten was opened up and very quickly it was denuded, uh, trashed and converted to cattle pasture and uh, right now uh, the Paten is, is, is suffering uh, because of their loss of tree cover. Those of you may remember, I think it was two years ago they had a drought in, in the Paten which affected in the, the southern Paten and in uh, neighboring Quiche departments and Alto Verapaz. Over a million farmers lost their corn crops that failed because of lack of precipitation when they anticipated it. Uh, they also had villages that completely ran out of drinking water. Uh, and this is what we can look forward to in the future if we don't repair um, our, and, and maintain our hydrological cycle by keeping trees on hillsides. Uh, this is just a, a, some more cheery imagery. This is a 30 year period between uh, 1980 and 2010 showing uh, rates of forest sort of from composite satellite imagery. You can see how much forest has been disappeared. Oh, good. totally unrelated. Sorry, that was from another slideshow. That's biochar. That'll be later. It's a teaser. Come back. Uh, and right now, the major, I, I work primarily in Toledo district, I, you know, and, and South Stan Creek. And I work in the foothills of the Maya Mountains and in the communities that, that work there uh, and live there. And uh, this is one of the problems that we see, that the, the deforestation is continuing for slash and burn and for maize production. And that's actually increasing because right now communities that were on the periphery of the currency-based economy are now participating in the currency-based economy uh, for very valid reasons, access to healthcare, access to goods and services, access to education. But instead of a per capita rate of deforestation, uh, they're increasing that to access markets for their, their maize and other crops that require slash and burn, and population density is increased as well. So we're seeing more and more slash and burn and more and more uh, uh, disappearing trees. These are some farmers I was working with when I managed Toledo cacao growers uh, in, in Bladen and Triad area. Uh, and they're Honduran refugees and, and that settled in Toledo district. And we were working with them to get them to plant cacao. Every one of the guys there, except for the guy holding the, the, the chalkboard is Ignacio Ash, my neighbor across the river, and one of the, the former extension officers of Toledo cacao growers. He, uh, all these farmers had planted out three to five acres of cacao. And they had been working on it for about five years, and then a fire that was lit many miles away, and the farmer lost control of the fire, just churned through the bush, and when it hit their cacao, it just erased all of their work that they put in for years. Now, these farmers didn't just plant one acre of cacao, because your average cacao holding in Toledo district is about an acre, um, with, with some large farmers and some smaller. These guys had gone big. They'd gone three to five acres each. So it was a massive and catastrophic loss of labor and potential income for their community. Uh, this is another thing we had. Uh, we were teaching at, at a school called Tumokian School of Learning, which is in Toledo district. And every day that we would taught, we only taught once or twice a month. We would pass every time we passed, we passed this hillside. This hillside was cleared by Guatemalan refugees. Um, and as you can see, if you look at the the picture, I don't know how well it shows. Uh, that land is limestone. It's primarily, it's a hillside with limestone. Uh, it is land that is really not suitable for maize production. Uh, and yet it was cleared for maize production. Uh, most of the maize actually didn't produce well because the soil is not very rich. Um, and they could have, if they had left it and thinned around the trees, the Ramon nut trees, the Brasoma malacostrum, they probably would have gotten as much calories as they would have gotten off of the corn without having to clear it. Now the problem with clearing this is that when you clear this, 
on truly marginal land like this, what you're looking at is a recovery period me measured in decades. It's not a nine-year fallow period. That's going to be 30, 40 years before that starts to replicate the ecosystem functions that it was providing earlier, namely carbon sequestration, soil and soil moisture retention, and habitat creation. So this, this, and we're going to see more of this as the region's population expands. We'll see more land like this that should not be cleared for agriculture and yet is being cleared for agriculture. Uh, those of you may remember last July, particularly uh, down in Toledo, we got significant rain in, in not July, in February, excuse me, uh, in the beginning of our dry season, in a period where uh, most people grow in their vegas, which is seasonally inundated flood plains. Uh, we had very significant floods in February. Um, and this is was something that most farmers are not anticipating because the February is supposed to be dry. And this flood came and wiped out many hundreds and hundreds of farmers lost their corn crop, their Matambre corn crop. Uh, my wife and I, this is actually from San Benito Poite. Um, I got the picture from Valentino Shell, who is unfortunately not here, hoping to see him today. But uh, anyway, uh, and this is part of the problems that we're going to face in the future with climate change variability when we're seeing uh, weather patterns that we can anticipate in the past uh, that we can't anticipate it anymore. So apropos of nothing, here is a vegetarian pizza with pesto and moringa. I'm just putting that in there so that we can transition from all the doom and gloom and how depressing and horrible everything is to look at something more exciting. And plus, also, it's a way to entice those of you who are in inclined to come all the way down to Toledo and come up the river to our farm. Every Saturday we have pizza, and we like visitors, so pizza. So this is not figuratively yesterday, but this is uh, a couple years ago. This is what I look at outside of my window when I wake up every morning. Um, in line of sight, we can see Mayflower, there's some Samwood, there's uh, some Guazuma homofolia, they call it base eater or Pichoy. Uh, there is cacao, there's coffee, there's coconuts, there's caimito, there's avocado. Um, underneath that we have ginger, we have turmeric, we have in there vanilla. Um, and what you're looking at right there in 1988 when I bought my farm was cattle pasture. And it was completely degraded. It's cattle pasture that had been managed too long. It was compacted and it took many years of work and managing succession to go from this degraded landscape to this very productive landscape that you're looking at. This is a small section of the farm. The, uh, the fact of the matter is right now, that area requires almost no labor. I just go, I harvest the banana, I collect the cacao, I dig up the, the, the turmeric, I harvest the coffee. There's not actually any planting anymore, it's just maintaining it. And so while we're getting these things for us, and these are all we're getting, uh, medicinal crops in there, there's different kinds of medicinal plants that are in there. We're getting marketable crops, things like coffee and cacao. We're getting food like uh, the caimito. We're getting timber like the samwood and the mayflower. Um, we are also providing ecosystem services of carbon sequestration, soil and soil moisture retention, and habitat creation. So this is a model that, that is actually working. This is not theory. This is something we're, we're actually doing and have been doing for a long time. So Forester Farm, uh, we had a student that came uh, from France uh, and he and his girlfriend were there and he, they arrived at a time we had a push. We really had to put a lot of trees in the nursery and we went straight into that. We didn't give him a farm tour. And uh, so after a couple days, he was unsatisfied. He was expecting like, he didn't see the food. He's walking through a forest of food trees, but he didn't see it. And he says, Christopher, we are leaving because uh, this is not a farm, you have some houses in the jungle and you are doing the work because there was only jungle and it's like, okay, number one, it was a little insulting to say that we're not doing any work, but number two, it was a compliment. He, he's walking through the middle of a farm, a cultivated area that is providing all the things I was talking about. Uh, marketables, medicinals, food, fodder, and uh, firewood and timber, uh, while at the same time, uh, replicating those ecosystem functions, but he didn't see it. All he saw was jungle. That was a huge compliment because that's what we're aiming for. We're looking to create a model that replicates the arboreal architecture, the form and function of primary habitat. Uh, okay. 
Okay. So this is, uh, I'm going to have to actually read this, and if it's in small enough text that you're, you can't actually read it, but there's reasons why we want to do this. Number one, uh, we sequester carbon, uh, we build soil, we uh, retain soil and soil moisture, we create habitat, we obtain yields from year one, and that's very important for farmers. Um, there was a project that came to Toledo many years ago, and they were telling people, plant mahogany trees, and the farmer's like, okay, yeah, now what? And they said, well, wait 50 years. And so you can imagine the amount of buy-in they had. Nobody, I don't think any of those mahogany trees are still there. Um, we maximize edge, which is a, 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 as each branch grows and puts out more dendritic branches, you have more nodes of production. So the older it gets, the more you produce. Uh, you get, um, uh, it's possible on marginal land, land, particularly degraded land, with the purpose of the conference has talked about how do we regenerate land. This is possible on, on, on degraded land. Um, you produce from year one, you have annual harvest cycles of uh, producing different things based on seasonality, but you also have uh, long-term harvest cycles like timber species. Uh, you have internal nutrient cycling like uh, an existing rainforest that the trees are mining nutrients from the subsoil and dropping it down to the ground. Um, and um, you're attracting habitat, you're creating habitat and attracting wildlife. We've seen all the cats of the leaves on our farm Jaguar, ocelot, puma, margay, jaguarunde have all passed through our farm. We had a jaguar grab a chicken in broad daylight a couple months ago. That was uh, a little too exciting for me. You know, I prefer, prefer to see my jaguars at the zoo than instead of running through and stealing a chicken in, in the middle of the day. And uh, we think maybe that's because we are adjacent to Columbia Forest Reserve and he was passing through to access the water at the river because there's no water up there. Such farms are economically resilient. We have 500 crops that we're dealing with, 500 species of plants. So if, if the market fails for cacao and a disease comes and wipes out all the coconuts, we still have 498 other species that we can work with. It's really important for farmers to diversify. And um, so we're economically, uh, we're biologically resilient and we're also economically resilient. If a market goes bad for any single crop, we have multiple other species that we can draw. Uh, there's a bunch of other reasons we're going to move on. So one of the things that we talk about is to obtain a yield from year one. It's really important. You can't tell a farmer's like this project that came and pushed mahogany trees and that wait 50 years and then you're going to have something. Uh, you need farmers need to obtain a yield from year one. So. What we're looking at is we're looking at the primary forest and what happens when that's degraded, what comes back. We see things like the, the Cecropia or trumpet tree, uh, the Shizolibium parahybum or, or uh, Quamwood, Bursura simruba or Gumbo Limbo, the Heliconia. These are all the species that come back. This is nature's repair kit. And so what we're looking for is selecting species that do our analogs to that, that provide some of the same things. Instead of Heliconia, we might use, for example, banana or plantain. Um, instead of quam wood, we might use uh, uh, gunga pea, the pigeon pea kajanus kajan, uh, which is a short-lived semi-perennial, two or three years, uh, which they call it chicharro, the Hondurans call it chicharro. Um, and uh, uh, we might put pineapples on contour to collect nutrients that will give a yield in year two. Uh, we might use vetiver grass or, or lemon grass also to retain soil. That will give another yield. And I see cassava there. Cassava is good for breaking up soil. Turmeric is good for breaking up soil. Coco yam is good for breaking, breaking up soil. So in terms of energy returned on invested, what we're looking for is food that's going to give us a lot of yield and it's not going to cost a lot of energy to do it. Um, and so uh, we have a picture here of something called uh, Articarpus uh, camansi, also known as bread nut or castaña in Spanish. And this is in my opinion, this is probably the most important potential food uh, for, for farmers. Every farm in Belize should have this because if your corn crop fails, this is not going to fail. This is not going to fail and you can get a lot of food from a single tree um, and it's 11% protein and 5% fat and so it's fantastic food. You can eat it. I did six months eating nothing but that. I didn't eat rice, I didn't eat flour, I didn't eat corn. 
just to see if I could survive off of it. I did. My diet got really boring, I can tell you. Uh, and I remember my first plate of rice and beans was like ambrosial, it was heaven. So, but it is possible. And what we're looking at in the very near future is a time when our corn crops may fail because of lack of rain, or our rice may fail because of too much rain. And what we want to do is we're looking at these tree species because they have deep roots and they're able to withstand inundation. And because they have deep roots, they're able to access moisture that short-rooted grasses cannot access. So these are some of the species. I'm going to do a comparison uh, between annuals, like corn, which can produce up to uh, point, uh, half a ton to four tons per hectare in Belize. Uh, rice can produce up to 10 tons per hectare. Uh, typically produces less than that. Uh, the common bean can produce up to five tons per hectare. Typically produces less than that. Uh, and soybean, which can produce up to 6.2 tons per hectare. Now, that's a significant amount of food, but we're, we're talking more than just the kilograms we're getting out of the land. We're also looking at the energy that goes into doing that. To do any of those, you're working to create a static condition of a field of rice, beans, or corn. It means you're spending a lot of energy to stop the, the biological inevitable of succession, where other species want to get in and get established and grow. So you, you're, you're doing weed control and you're chopping. And what we're talking about doing with these other trees is taking succession and just working with it. Anybody see somebody who studies Aikido? Aikido is this martial art where somebody throws a punch and take their hand and you throw them effortlessly across the room. I used to do a little bit of martial arts, so I was never any good. You could probably all beat me up. But I had a friend of mine who was into Aikido and I sparred with him. And every time I, 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 I put any effort into anything, he would just throw me around the room. It was really, you know. Um, anyway, that's what we're, we're working on, the equivalent of biological Aikido. We're working with nature's energy to do that. So the species that we're promoting and that we're talking about here include uh, Sacha Inchi, which there's a lot of work, uh, work talk about Sacha Inchi because oil uh, has omega-3 oils, which is, can usually only be sourced in fish. Uh, you can get up to four tons of that per, per hectare, and that uh, produces oil and protein. Uh, the Articarpus altilis, or breadfruit, which is very common in Belize, can produce up to 16 tons per hectare, and that's starch. Uh, the Articarpus heterophylla, also known as jackfruit, can produce, uh, needs more research, I couldn't actually get the numbers on that, but if anybody who's seen a tree knows it's very, very productive. And that produces fruit, oil, and starch. Um, the Brassima malacostrum, which is native to Belize. Anybody who spent time wandering around in the jungle lost like I used to do back in my 20s will know that anywhere you find a Maya ruin, there's going to be Ramon trees close to it. They're all, all out there in the bush in high abundance. And a, a, uh, uh, an, a hectare of Ramon can produce up to 7.5 uh, tons per hectare. Um, uh, da, da, da. And that actually produces protein and a little bit of oil and some starch. Uh, Bactris gassy pace or peach palm, southern Belize is still in the range where peach palm naturally occurs. They call peach palm pejibaya in, in Spanish and they have other names for it. Uh, that can produce up to, oh yeah, 30 tons per hectare and it produces primarily starch, but it also produces a little bit of protein and oil and seed. Uh, the bread. Uh, Red nut, which I mentioned in the other slide, can produce up to 11 tons per hectare, and that is one of the that is that is my favorite tree of all. It is sort of like my wife. It produces for nine months of the year. My wife and I go out every morning with buckets and pick up red nut, and we use it to feed. We have fed pigs in the past. We're not presently in the pig business, uh, but we, we we raise poultry with it, and it's that's also like a fantastic food. Energy return on energy invested once it's established is literally going out with a pig a pigtail bucket and a machete and scooping up buckets full of food. Uh, things like air potato, uh, diasporia, uh, bulbifera can produce up to 19 tons per hectare. Kajanus kajan or pigeon pea, which is a fantastic pioneer species, short-lived semi-perennial, uh, uh, two or three years, can produce up to 6.8 tons per hectare dry weight, and that's protein. Uh, there's Moringa oleifera, 22 tons per hectare. Uh, coconut can produce two to four tons per hectare oil. Um, Persea americana or avocado can produce up to 32 tons per hectare of food. 
Um, and Ipomea patata or sweet potato uh, can produce uh, up to 5.4, and then uh, and we already covered that after a little bit more. So there's two things. Number one, I am not an academic. I, I, uh, uh, and two things, I'm not an academic. So these are not numbers. This is just an idea. This is anecdotal experience. The other thing I'm not is a computer graphics designer, because you can tell that doesn't look very good. But nevertheless, this represents my experience. The two lines are red and green. Uh, the, green the red line shows the amount of energy I've expended anecdotally, and this is probably not very accurate, but in the first five years we spend a lot of energy doing establishment. We get a lot of production because the, the pioneer species, the banana, the pineapple, the pigeon pea, uh, the cassava, the cocoa yam, the corn if we're growing corn or beans, all produce a lot of food. But by year five, the perennials start to yield, and by year 10, the actual work has dropped down to maintenance. I'm, I'm going in there, I'm chopping a little bit, I'm mostly collecting food. You can see uh, from year 10, the red line, just flat lines, it's only doing maintenance. And the food production line, it just goes completely off the, off the top of the page. It's absolutely amazing. It just disappears because that, anyway, it's an anecdote. I, I, I can't tell you how much we're producing because the numbers I gave you in the previous slide, we're not managing it like that. We're not gonna get 10 tons of this per hectare because in one hectare, we could have 60, 60 or 70 different species of plants. So these are more numbers. Um, so this is an example of energy returned on energy invested. This is Marlon Sutherland, who was visiting us and lived on the farm for about nine months. And one morning, he and I went out and collected food uh, in about 45 minutes of collecting food. Um, you can see from the big grin on him and the fact that we're, he's not sweating, and I went, what, I'm not, wasn't sweating. We weren't really working. We were just walking around picking up food and, and joking and talking. And we off camera, which you can't see, are two buckets full of bread nut. And he said, hey, quick, get a picture of me. Look what all we collected in, in 45 minutes of walking around and collecting. Now, things like banana can be used as staple food. Pineapple is a food that has limited market value. There's ways to add value to it. We do things like canning it. Uh, I, I used to can pineapple jam. And then around Christmas, I'd go to the market and harass my friends to buy stuff for their mom. Uh, and that worked, actually. It was a good supplemental income. Uh, Coconut, my wife and I make coconut oil. We have a, had a plan the other day that we were gonna retire and get rich making coconut oil. Uh, I can tell you from experience that chances are we are not gonna retire or get rich making coconut oil. But we don't have to buy oil anymore because we make all, all of our coconut oil. Uh, and the, the partially defatted coconut meat is useful for feeding pigs and chickens, of course, which are a part of the larger ecology that we have and their manure is cycled back to the farm. So high value species that exist in the matrix of what we're talking about include things like cacao. Uh, cacao is, is native to Belize. It's one of the species, in fact, in every Maya language, the word for cacao is cacao. From, from their 33 Maya languages, every Maya language calls cacao cacao. And it's one of the words, one of the few Maya words that has migrated out to the rest of the world. You go to Sulawesi, or you, and you go to Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, you say cacao, they know what you're talking about. But cacao is native to this area. And the fact of the matter is that um, apart from the, the hybrid Hershey cacao that was bought back in, bought in by the uh, Tam Fighter Project in the 80s and the early 90s, uh, most of the cacao, what we call the traditional or heirloom cacaos in Belize, are of an exceptional quality, make very high value chocolate. And that's part of the thing that we're talking about with farmers. We have a, a very exclusive market. We sell, we're selling our cacao by the pound internationally. We don't sell it into the local market because we get a really good price by the pound exporting, but it's based on the cultivars. Um, another species that is also native to the political boundaries of Belize and the region is vanilla. And uh, we produce, uh, we have three or four different species of vanilla. We have vanilla planifolia, vanilla hearty, vanilla pompona, and one other. I do not know that much about vanilla. My ex-wife who presented here, she hates my guts, we don't get along with it. It happens. Um, she actually knows more about vanilla than probably anybody in Belize. And her name's Dawn Dean. She's worth looking up if you're interested in vanilla. Um, and she's got a, a seed bank uh, site, in situ living 
seed bank of, of various kinds of vanilla. But vanilla enjoys a very high price. So those of you who know San Pedro, Colombia, probably if you, you, if you know about San Pedro, Colombia, you probably are thinking ganja. And the fact of the matter is, Colombia, not so long ago, was a very big marijuana producer. Marijuana at its top, from so I hear, because I know very little about this, uh, um, uh, produced, uh, maybe got $200 a pound. A few years ago, vanilla was $250 a pound, US. Not $200, please, $200, $500 a pound, please, for vanilla. And there was no uh, looking over your shoulder or worrying uh, like marijuana or say avocados that you might get caught by the guacamole suppression unit or n uh, none, none, of, none of that. Uh, so vanilla, and what, what I like about vanilla, vanilla lends itself to the home garden. It requires no special strength. It's just hand, just hand, hand pollinating. Uh, and so vanilla has a wonderful place in this. You can do it close to the home. Uh, you can hand pollinate. That's my wife holding a, a, some vanilla that she planted. Um, my present wife, the happy wife. Uh, and uh, that's some vanilla that she planted. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's actually was pollinated by, by insects. And we, we think it was either pollinated by the Meloponini bee, because we have colonies of that, or maybe the midges that also pollinate cacao. Because this was close to where we're growing lots of cacao, and some of the cacao pods have been broken, and midges have colonized it. Another high value crop that you're hearing a lot about now is turmeric. Uh, turmeric was introduced uh, to Belize by the East Indian migration, specifically in Toledo District. The migration of 1878, when indentured servants were brought over to work in the sugarcane industry, and they bought their, their turmeric with them. My understanding from people who know a lot more about this than me is that the cultivars that were growing in Toledo District are actually higher in some alkaloid and some medicinal properties than much of the of turmeric that's actually growing in India right now. And that it, it is nutritionally and culinarily important. So this is uh, uh, another thing that is very possible to grow in the matrix of an agroforestry system underneath all your other species. Uh, and it has very high value. So there's a precedent for everything that we're talking about. Any of the people in this room who spent time wandering around lost in the jungle in either Cheeky Bull or Maya Mountain Forest Reserve or Columbia Forest Reserve will know that wherever you find a Maya ruin, you find lots of Ramon. You will find Ramon in very high density close to Maya ruins. Now we know that the ancient Maya had uh, tool makers, cloth makers, paper makers, they had artisans, they had uh, architects, they had a uh, base 20 mathematics system with concept of zero, they had vast trade routes. I'm digging on my farm all the time, I pop up a piece of obsidian or a stone chart for a matate. Those, those minerals are not native to the political boundaries of Belize, so they had to be traded in over great distances. Uh, we know that they had trade, uh, they were able to track the, the movement of the celestial bodies so accurately that they can still predict lunar and solar eclipses based on their calendar. Uh, they had standing armies, and all the people that I just talked about, and, and the cultural fluorescence and the cultural aesthetic that makes uh, the, the ancient Maya are unique, none of the people I just talked about are producing food. So the food that they were producing had to be a highly sophisticated model of food production to get to the level of surplus to float that degree and amount of calorically non-productive people and to support that level of uh, specialization. So there are different theories about this. Uh, Dr. Annabelle Ford, who's done a lot of work up at El Pilar, her theory is that Ramon Nut uh, fueled that. And I have to say that I, I think I agree with her because every time I'm lost in the jungle and I see a bunch of Ramon Nut, I'm standing on a Maya ruin. It's literally all over in the jungle, Ramon Nut. Ramon Nut is very high in protein. Uh, it's very easy to accumulate. In 1973, when the corn crop failed in Yucatan, an anthropologist recorded that a woman and four children were able to collect uh, enough food to feed a family of eight for a year. Now, I don't know if that was 20, I don't remember because I read this like 20 years ago, but I don't remember if it was 
uh, 24 hours of collective labor or 24 hours of everybody working for 24 hours. But if you consider the energy returned on energy invested, it hardly matters. To be able to support a family of eight and even 120 or 150 hours of labor, to support a family of eight for a year on, on, as a, a staple crop is very impressive. So that's one of the things that we can look forward to here in Belize. If our corn crops fail, we should all be growing Ramon and other trees like that because then we'll have something to fall back on. They also make excellent animal food. So one of the ways we do this is we do trainings. We do trainings in permaculture. Um, we do trainings in agroforestry. And uh, the permaculture design course, which is a 72-hour course, uh, has a specific pedagogy that we find reaches all levels. We have farmers whose reading and writing skills are, are, are not perfect, uh, but whose botanic literacy is very high. And we're also teaching PhD students whose literacy is very high, but their botanic and systems thinking is not very high. And so the permaculture design pedagogy actually teaches um, a lot of what we're talking about. It gives you the tools to look at land and come up with the kind of things that I came up with. Uh, some of the things that we've been able to do uh, because of who we are, we have leverage support in years past. We've got support from PACT uh, we, uh, for the first two permaculture design courses we did. Uh, the, we've got three, for three years we've got support, support from something called Lush Fund, from Lush Cosmetics. Um, we've had private support, private donors have given us money. Um, and so we get support for that. And even when we don't get support, we still give scholarships to local people. Um, because we're able to, because it doesn't actually cost us that much to feed another two or three people. And the teachers that we work with are willing to accommodate that. Uh, this was actually, Lush Fund funded this, and they funded three years in a row, 16 Belizeans to take our, our permaculture design course. Uh, this was something that was funded by uh, UNDP Global Environment Fund um, it, through Yaxche Conservation Trust, which is an organization we work with closely in Toledo District to talk about using permaculture as a tool for climate change mitigation, specifically emphasizing uh, ways to retain moisture in the landscape and uh, produce backup food systems uh, for other things. I just want to say a shout out to Don Thompson, who's back there. I don't see you very often. Hello, Don. Uh, so a good guy, if you want to talk about vetiver, there's nobody in this country who knows more about vetiver than him. Um, Lastly, we're coming up towards the end of it. Uh, we talk about ecosystem services of these farms. I already mentioned carbon sequestration. I talked about habitat creation. I talked about soil and soil moisture retention, the hydrological cycle. But habitat is really important in Belize. And one of the, a lot of the work done by the Belize Zoo to educate every child in this country about the importance of habitat. I think many children in this country know the habitat song. Habitat, habitat, you gotta have that. Anyway, um, because of the work that they've done, one of the things that we talk about when we look at farms is bird counts. So the work that organizations like Audubon do to count bird species are really important to understand what's going on ecologically in the health of the country. Uh, we Probably everybody knows about the canary in, in, in a cage. So back in the day when the coal miners would go down in the mine, they'd bring the canary down into the cage with them and they'd work, and if the canary fell over dead, they knew that there was something terribly wrong and they got out. And that was an indicator that things were not good. So when we start to look at farms and we see high degrees of bird diversity, that's actually an indicator that things are going right. Uh, we get bird watchers who come to the farm and they walk around with their binoculars and, and, and their little pen and their checklist on the verge of a spontaneous orgasm because they saw some little brown bird uh, and yeah, so you guys all know birders and they're, they're great people and it's actually really good because it applies the value to, to these systems. It applies value to our natural habitat to say these birds are there. But for us, looking at it not as a birder, I'm not a birder, but to look at it and say, well, birds are there, that's a sign of uh, environmental health. So one of the things we talk about is if we have different neighbors who have different blocks of land parallel to each other, and each farmer is managing a section of their farm this way that touch each other, we can take, make, create contiguous uh, biological corridors of managed agroforestry systems 
for habitat, specifically for birds, specifically for mammals, specifically for reptiles. Um, and that's some of the work that we'd like to see going on in Belize in the future, and some of the work that we, we hope to be facilitating and helping uh, in the coming years. So this is the end of my slideshow. Um, this is a, a fellow by the name of Mr. Pablo Cal. Uh, I managed Toledo Cacabros from 1997 to 2004. I had three chairmen that I had to work with. Uh, one was Mr. Cayetano Ico, who passed yesterday, uh, passed right through here yesterday. Got to wave and say hello. Uh, the other one, uh, one, the other one, the other one worth talking about is Mr. Pablo Cal. Now I had the pleasure and the, and the privilege to work with this man over a 20 some odd year period of time. Uh, he was chairman of cacao growers. I uh, did be took beekeeping training with him, learned how to manage Africanized bees in 1989. Uh, I worked on a solar water pumping project with Plenty International, which was the uh, predecessor of Plenty Belize. Uh, and one of the days I, I showed up, I, I, on Thursdays I would go visit the various sites that had these pumps. And I would always show up at Mr. Pablo's house around 11.30. Because if I showed up at 11.30, I was going to get lunch uh, and, and get to hang out and listen to his stories. Because he was a, a wonderfully fascinating guy with a wealth of experience and one of the kindest human beings I've ever met. I never, in, 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 in my many, many, many years of association with him, never heard him speak poorly of another person. Even people that we knew spoke poorly of him. He was that kind of person. So one day I show up at 11.30, and it, this was a soybean project, and soybean is a, a for, for milpa farmers, soybean is a nonsensical crop. You make more money with, with red kidney beans or black beans, and soybeans require more processing, you don't get that I'm, I'm Anyway, so, but it was a soybean project, so he had his soybeans, he's doing what he's supposed to, and in, in amongst his soybeans he's got his habanero, which is actually what was making the money, a little bit of diversification, but he wasn't tending that at that time. He was watering mahogany trees. So I went up to Mr. Pablo. I said, Mr. Pablo, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm watering my mahogany trees. I said, yeah, but you know, what's the plan? You, you're planning to stick around long enough for these mahogany trees to bear? Mahogany tree takes about 50 years. Mr. Pablo was 65 at the time. And he said, no, I'm doing this for my kids. I'm doing this for my kids' kids, for my grandchildren. I'm doing this for people who's probably won't even know my name, but I have no, nothing better to do and I still have some work in my body, so I'm gonna water my mahogany trees today. I had was to look away. I nearly burst into tears right there. It's like, you know, that, that Steven Spielberg respect for a spot in the movie, like, E.T., go home, you know. So I had to look away, because it, it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever heard another person say, and Mr. Pablo was so exceptional that he didn't realize how exemplary what he was saying was. So he was a, a, a wonderful, wonderful person. He died a few years ago, um, and I, I bumped into his son when I was coming back from a conference in Cuba. And I asked him, I didn't realize it was son. It was like, oh, you're Carl, you're from San Jose, uh, San Antonio. What are you to Mr. Pablo? That's my father. How's he doing? He's dying of cancer. The man died of cancer. I went to visit him and I talked with him again. Um, and. Uh, I, they asked me to write the eulogy, and I thought about all the changes that he'd seen in San Antonio. Those of you who have been to San Antonio, Toledo, know that big stone church that is, you look, that, you think of San Antonio, you think of that church. When he was born, that church wasn't there. In fact, the stones at the top of the wall, he put up there when he was 12 years old. Because he was small and light enough and could haul a bucket full of stone to put up there. Um, Mr. Pablo was planting trees for people that wouldn't know his name. So I implore and I beg and I ask of all of you um, that you channel your inner Pablo call. We are all here but for a short time. Belize will be here after we are gone. Uh, and the results of our work should be here after we're gone as well. So I encourage everybody to plant a tree and plant more trees and plant more trees. And I think I just ran out of steam and ran out of stuff. And so I'm gonna say, Thank you very much for attending my talk, um, and then we'll go to questions after the oblig obligatory round of applause. I'll wait for that. <laughs> you. So we'll go to questions. Does anybody have any questions? For this, we're having a speaking panel. So the questions. Did you not record any questions?
then I don't need any microphone. I hate these things. Oh, oh you guys get to ask if the question. Want to, or you can ask me and I'll repeat the question. If yeah, I that's what we did yesterday. Uh, the question is whether, how well does Ramon do in clay? Ramon does not do well in cl clay. Ramon really needs limestone. Um, and so we, we have areas of the farm with, with clay where Ramon has sprouted, it was carried in by something. Um, and so what we're doing is throwing dolomite on it and it seems to do well with dolomite. So, um, you know, that's, um, that's our experience. Um, we, every, basically, we don't have wet feet where we are. We're in the hills. Basically, every part of our land that's flat is a mire ruin or a floodplain. Otherwise, it's like this. So. I, I'm interested in the bread now. How do you prepare it to be edible? Uh, Asmani asked a, a, a question about the bread nut. So the bread nut is, uh, the common name for bread nut includes Ramon nut, so I don't like using the, the, the common name um, because uh, uh, in Belize, I, we have to deal with Ketri speaking farmers, Mopan farmers, Garifuna farmers, Creole farmers, and Spanish farmers, and Spanish alone. They're from Honduras, they're from Guatemala, they're from Salvador, they're from Cayo, they're from Corozal. So the the, Brasso, the, the Articarpus Comanche bread nut uh, is, uh, my wife and I just boil it, and then you, you, you boil it, and then you put it in, we use a wood burning cook stove, we put it in the oven and it shrinks the meat a little, and then you can peel it and eat it like peanuts. Um, you can chop it up and saute it with onions or garlic. Um, my wife likes to make something like a hummus substitute with it, which is really fantastic. You could take day-old corn tortillas and fry them and eat them. It's, it's, it's pretty good. And yeah, uh, but we, uh, the honest truth of it is we mostly feed it to our animals, uh, our chickens and when we have pigs to that as well. Yeah, as a... Santiago Juan uh, mentioned it does actually make a good flour. We've done that before, but it's like more work than I really want to do. I am, th this system of farming in inspires laziness after it's established. <laughs> so, uh, I, I'm at the point right now, I'm 52 years old. I have probably another mm, 13, 14 years worth of work, and then I'm gonna look for two trees. I'm gonna buy one hammock. Uh, I've got a stack of books I'd like to read, maybe one book I'd like to write. And, uh, and that's what, the thing. in permaculture they say the designer is the recliner. But once the system is set up, you do less work, which is my experience. But my, my problem is I keep expanding. Uh, any other questions? Yes. this morning and one of, the, one of the ways we do that is uh, that we can encourage that is to get resort owners to start preparing those foods find a chef somebody who knows how to cook to start using them and so and put it on the menu and hype it up yeah this is breadfruit we use it we use it for this that and the other and you'll have uh, fried breadfruit and uh, the, the hummus dip made from the seeds of the jackfruit or the articarpus tree and um, yeah um, so I, I think it, it's really about being able to, um, it's, I think the verb would be to pimp local foods and seasonality. It's one of the problems with tourism that a lot of people come from abroad and expect what they get at home. I mean, I go, I, I, we don't, I don't go to many resorts. Um, uh, once a year, my wife and I will go to Placencia for the weekend on her birthday, um, and, uh, and a lot of the food there in the past was fairly generic and not, you know, it might be rice and beans officially and, the, you know, that's fine. But now they're actually working to encourage and, and have other things on the menu, some of the, the resorts. So I think it's really largely up to the resorts and the chefs that they work with to start to incorporate some of these things. Yeah. 
and maybe put it in a cultural context or pimp it as ecologically sensitive. You know, this is a tree that sequesters X amount of carbon per year and it's retaining soil and the trogans like to eat the fruit and whatever it is that you eat. They're, they're, all of these tree species have a desirable attributes and I think that the, the, um, to make them be used is would require education and sharing movement of information. Regeneration, I believe, just started a few months ago, but we're, we're, we're setting it up so that we could do that. Um, and, and one of the things that, that we really want to do um, is start mapping out a database of who produces what in the country, specifically to target markets, markets like that. Because preferential markets are great. Preferential local markets are great. Um, I, 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 for tourism managers, it's difficult because you, you, you have fluctuation in arrivals, um, and then you're dealing with seasonality. I mean, everybody likes cabbage. You can't, if you're a farmer, you just can't grow cabbage around the calendar. We don't, like in, in our rainy season, we don't produce cabbage, we don't, we produce chaya, and we produce the, the Malabar spinach, and uh, the chipiling, and uh, the moringa. Those are all the greens that we have to use in the rainy season, um, because we can't produce cabbage. If we had a hoop house, we probably could, but the, the embodied energy in, in making a hoop house economically for us is prohibitive. So, uh, but it, it could be done. It just needs more management and planning. Yes. And with neem, yes, uh, neem is one of the species that we use. Uh, we sometimes use a stick to brush our teeth. We dry the leaves when we're storing beans. We dry the leaves and then we dry the beans until they're uh, ideally less than 14% humidity and throw the dried leaves in there and it tends to keep the, 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 the weevils away. Um, it's, it, uh, it has medicinal values. I mean, ne neem is so useful for so many things. Uh, it's used in Ayurvedic medicine. It's, you, um, my, my wife, we make coconut oil and my wife makes a, like a poultice with coconut oil and neem and we use it to get rid of fleas on our dog. So there's things, it can fit, it actually fits really neatly into this. It, um, if you have the period uh, place with the right amount of sunlight. So Neem, is, it, Neem has a role. Anybody else? Can you tell us a little bit about the teaching styles at the farm and how it translates to you? Oh, okay, Fran, who is our social coordinator, she was an intern and now she's helping us uh, uh, basically spread the message. And, uh, and she's live streaming on Facebook, theoretically. I don't know if that's actually coming through. Hello, Facebook friends. Uh, <laughs> Some of us here, Osmani and I are Facebook friends. Uh, so, um, uh, the question. Teaching style. Oh, teaching style. So, one of the things is yes. So, the, we, what we found is when I managed to lead all cacao growers, we would get a, doc, a doctor, we, uh, Gabriela Soto from Cartier would come to talk to the farmer. She would draw on the chalkboard, and it would actually make sense to the farmer. But that pedagogy of classroom learning. <laughs> for many farmers is not useful because they, they uh, particularly in Toledo, farmers will get to a certain level and then they leave school to go work. Uh, then there's always the other question. There'll be one farmer in the back who's like this. I'll be like, that's really great, uh, Gabriella. How much cacao do you have? And she'd be like, well, I've done my research on uh, cacao at these, uh, I've been to like 800 farms in 15 countries. And, but she doesn't actually grow cacao, so the validity of her information is dropped. So my amount research farm was specifically set up to be a living classroom. We have 38 beds for students, um, and so that when farmers walk through the farm, it's not theory, they're actually seeing it. And so a farmer who may not be able to read and write well, their <coughs> botanic literacy is going to be very high. So they're going to walk, they're going to know all the species of plants, a species of plants they don't know, they're going to hone in on. What's that? Oh, that's peach palm. Why would you grow peach palm? It's really thorny. It's an undesirable attribute. And you say, well, actually, in the Amazon, um, my wife and I 
the head of consultancy in Peru, and the community we were working in, peach palm was their staple. Same way Maya people eat carne every day, these people ate peach palm every day, at least while, part of the year while we were there. So all of a sudden that plugs in, and the farmers can put this into the understanding of their farming knowledge, and they know all the species, and yeah, so a, a living classroom is useful. Yes, Osmani. I was actually with Valentino when he took that flooded Batam reporter. Oh, yes. So I, I was able to see the damaging and, and the impact that caused to, to our rural communities yes. in the Metropolitan. I've also seen a good friend of Henry Park in San Antonio yes. really practicing a lot of what you share. Yes. My question is, um, what can we do, what must be done, you think, to encourage um, a change in agricultural practices, moving away from the Matambre that we it's so that's what you depend on, and you know how vulnerable that is with all the changes, you know, because of climate change, etc. What can be done for, for farmers to move more towards this type of work? Two, two things that are needed. Num number one is support networks and access to, to genes, access to seed, access to extension, that's super important, and education. The farmer you mentioned, Uhimi Ah, is one of my students. and. Uh, in fact, when he left there, he got all fired up, and now he's planting trees, and his farm is doing amazing, and he's doing really great work. So we, that's what, an example of one of the students that, that got this information and is moving with it. And it's important for us to remember that this information, I didn't come up with this. This has been going on for thousands of years. We've just dumbed down our agriculture to the point where farmers are told, grow this, grow that. Even Ministry of Agriculture has some culpability in it because Ministry of Agriculture mostly promotes crops that have export value. Um, because export value brings money in, money in brings taxation, taxation pays their salary. Not saying that's wrong, of all into money coming into Belize, uh, but for food security we need to think more things that may not be, because how financially remunerative is a farm that's self-sufficient for food? They're not actually contributing to the economy, they're not going to the shop uh, and buying flour that came from ADM in Belize City. They're not actually going and buying the rice that's grown in Blue Creek. They're producing the food that, themselves. So part of the problem is that, that uh, uh, there's lack of access to education because ministry is specifically focused primarily on export crops for a very understandable reason. Yeah. Actually, when you introduced me to a term, I have not heard before, food sovereignty. Food sovereignty is a new thing. Food security is like, old school thinking, because I, I, I got into an argument with somebody on Facebook, uh, somebody here in Belize, and you know, Facebook is where you get into all the arguments. Civility goes right out the window. Uh, they'll say things to one another you wouldn't actually say in person, but this guy was saying, food security means having a job to make enough money to buy food. And I'm like, no, that's not, we got into a big thing. And then, of course, when we bumped into each other, it was a little awkward for, for five minutes. And then, then we got over it, we're friends. Uh, so yeah, food sovereignty is really important. And one of the ways we do that is we enable communities to take control of their food production. Um, and, and to remember that the practices that I'm talking about are indigenous to the entire planet. They've just been displaced uh, by 50, 60 years of forcing monocultures and the thoughts behind monocultures on it, on, on, on communities. Yeah. Any other last minute questions? You guys over there have been very quiet. Okay, okay. All right, well, I guess I'll end this uh, to my friends on Facebook. Hi, I'll argue with you later. And uh, thank you very much for coming. You, this, the world is a big place. This is a big venue. There are other people having other conversations. So thank you for taking the time out of your morning to come to this presentation. <laughs>